Today, we're diving into a gripping story that's unfortunately all too common. When a friend turns into a total criminal mastermind, you know the saying, with friends like these, who needs enemies? It's a harsh truth we sometimes face when someone we trust flips the script and betrays us in the worst possible way. We'll explore why some people pretend to be our pals only to stab us in the back, revealing the selfish motives behind their actions. But it's not just about the betrayal itself. It's about the aftermath and the shock of realizing someone we thought had our back is actually working against us. Trust me, this story is packed with twists and turns you won't want to miss. Let's dive in. The case of Sarah Stern shocked even veteran police officers with the cynicism and cold-bloodedness with which her closest friend, whom she had known since childhood and trusted implicitly, dealt with the unfortunate young woman. It was this friend with whom the student shared her future plans and a significant secret that no one else knew. By doing so, Sarah essentially signed her own death warrant, as from that moment until the tragic end, the young man lived with plans on how to make her disappear forever while remaining above suspicion. Surprisingly, this crime could have been prevented if those around had taken the perpetrator's words and actions more seriously. The criminal even laid out his plan on paper, presenting it as a script for a horror movie. But let's dissect this complex story from the beginning to understand what drove such a good friend who was Sarah Stern. Sarah Elizabeth Stern was born on March 24, 1997, in the small town of Neptune City in Monmouth County, New Jersey. She was the only and dearly beloved child in the simple family of Michael and Susan Stern. Due to health issues, Mrs. Stern couldn't have more children, so the parents poured all their love into their long-awaited daughter. Sarah grew up as an active, cheerful, and very sociable child. She performed on the school theater stage, was passionate about photography, drew well, and was involved in sports, competing for the local swimming team and playing softball. She dreamed of becoming an artist or designer and was preparing to apply to a local specialized college when a terrible tragedy struck her family. In the autumn of 2013, when 16-year-old Sarah had just graduated from high school and started college in the field of art she had dreamed of, her mother passed away. The woman had fought a long battle with cancer, and it seemed several times that the disease had receded, but the insidious illness returned with new force and ultimately won. This loss was a huge shock for the entire family, especially for the young girl who was always very close to her mother. For a while, Stern fell into depression, but she tried to support her father with whom she lived and who also had a hard time. They also lived with a dog named Buddy, whom the girl adored. Gradually, life began to improve. Sarah made plans for the future, and after graduating from college, she wanted to apply to a prestigious national university in New York. But before that, she dreamed of traveling the world particularly planning to visit Canada and perhaps even live there for some time. Michael Stern often had to travel out of state for work, sometimes for weeks at a stretch, but he never worried about leaving his daughter home alone because she was a grown independent young woman and their town was considered quiet and safe. However, in December 2016, when he flew out for another business trip, trouble came knocking at his door. On the night of December 3, 2016, around 2.30 a.m., a call came into the police station from a concerned man reporting a car abandoned in the middle of the Belmare Bridge along Highway 35. The area was quite deserted, rarely traversed by anyone at night, making the solitary empty vehicle immediately suspicious. The caller was a taxi driver taking a shortcut home over the old bridge on the outskirts. He noticed the car parked by the side and stopped to see if anyone needed help. Finding the cabin empty and no one around, he called the police, suspecting the driver might have come here to end their life by jumping into the water below, a sadly not uncommon occurrence at this spot. Responding officers noted the keys left in the ignition. There were no signs of blood in the car, nor any signs of a struggle, leading to the initial theory that someone came to the bridge with the intention of voluntarily leaving this world by jumping into the river below. 
The next step was to find out who owned the abandoned old silver sedan. A database check revealed the car belonged to one Lily Stern, a senior American citizen who recently celebrated her 85th birthday. She lived in the same town about 10 kilometers from where her car was found. Officers promptly visited Miss Stern's home to understand how and why the elderly woman's car ended up on the bridge at night. Lily was found at home alive, well, and surprised by the police visit. She explained that due to poor eyesight, she hadn't driven for years. Instead, her 19-year-old granddaughter, Sarah, was the one who drove the car. Concerned, Lily immediately tried to call Sarah, but her phone was turned off. She then gave the officers her son's address where he lived with Sarah, noting that only Sarah should be home since her father was away on a work trip and wouldn't be back until the next week. The mysteriously disappeared student Sarah was not at home, and the back door to the house was found open, a worrying sign. An initial sweep by the police inside revealed nothing suspicious, except for a dog whining, locked in one of the bedrooms. There was no indication of any crime taking place. Belongings were in order, and there were no signs of struggle, bloodstains, or any evidence of an intruder's presence. By then, news of the situation had reached Michael Stern, and he was on his way home on the first available flight. The homeowner confirmed everything was in its place and nothing was missing. Moreover, he stated that all of Sarah's personal belongings were also at home, including her passport, driver's license, and even her mobile phone, which she never parted with. The police shared their initial thoughts with Michael, suggesting his daughter might have gone to the bridge with the intention of jumping and asked if he had noticed any signs of suicidal tendencies or self-harm attempts. Michael admitted that after his wife's passing, Sarah had gone through a period of depression, but with the support of family, friends, and her studies, she managed to recover. Furthermore, she had big plans for the future, dreaming of becoming a designer, wanting to travel and see the world. Nonetheless, on the night of December 3rd, the student vanished from her own home, and a few hours later, her car was found abandoned on the bridge. These were the established facts. Sarah was officially missing, and the investigation had to figure out who she was in contact with that day, what conversation she had, and who saw her last. Testimonies from the first witnesses. It soon came to light that on December 2nd, Sarah Stern had spent nearly the entire day with her best friend, Liam McAtasney, whom she had known since childhood. Liam turned out to be the last person who saw her, potentially shedding light on this mysterious case. Thus, law enforcement quickly decided to speak with him to gather details and try to reconstruct the events of that day. Upon arriving at the McAtasney residence, police were met by Liam's mother, who informed them that her son was sleeping off a night shift. At the officer's request, she woke him up, seemingly confused about the situation. Liam was surprised to learn about Sarah's disappearance. He confirmed that they had spent most of the previous day together and agreed to go to the police station to provide his statement. Liam shared that they had gone to college together in the morning, but decided to skip the last two lectures since it was Friday and they wanted to relax. After class, they went back to her place, played video games, chatted, and shared their future plans. They left the house twice that day, once to grab food from a nearby fast food restaurant and another time to stop by a local supermarket. Around 7 o'clock in the evening, he left Sarah's house to head to his night shift at a 24-hour store and didn't see her after that. When asked if Sarah had been experiencing any psychological issues or other difficulties, Liam revealed quite a bit. He said that Sarah had been deeply depressed since her mother's passing, teetering between wanting to end it all or run away and start anew. He also mentioned that Sarah had had issues communicating with her father, struggling to find common ground. Liam didn't dismiss the possibility that Sarah might have taken her own life, but noted that shortly before disappearing, she had seriously considered moving to Canada and had even exchanged some money. His claim was confirmed by finding Canadian dollars in a bedside table drawer in Sarah's room, though the amount was so small it wouldn't have covered much. Another close friend and former classmate of Stern's, Preston Taylor, who had been her date to the high school prom and kept in touch after graduation, 
also gave a statement. He corroborated Liam's account, adding that Sarah was depressed and speculated that she either ran away to Canada or jumped off the bridge. By the end of the conversation, he was in tears, expressing how much Sarah meant to him. The search for the body and questioning other witnesses led to the theory of Sarah fleeing to Canada being almost immediately dismissed since she couldn't have left the country without her passport. Law enforcement then focused on the Grimmer theory and organized a massive search effort in the river. The search was complicated by the strong current in that area, which could quickly carry a body miles away from the bridge. Divers were deployed, special equipment was used, and police, along with hundreds of volunteers, scoured both banks of the river looking for remains or any of Sarah's belongings. Among the volunteers actively participating in the search were also Liam and Preston. Unfortunately, despite all efforts, no trace of Sarah was found. Therefore, law enforcement decided to continue questioning people who knew her and were close to her. That's when a peculiar discrepancy emerged. According to friends and classmates, Sarah was not depressed. She was in great spirits, and none had heard about any problems with her father. On the contrary, she always spoke of him warmly and lovingly. However, after Sarah's disappearance, Liam and Preston behaved as if they had lost a close relative, garnering sympathy from many. But soon, people started to notice that their behavior was odd, as if they were performing for an audience. The two had become very close, but this development occurred about a month before the incident. Therefore, the police decided to take a closer look at the friends and re-interview them. When Liam was brought back to the station for further questioning, he appeared deeply distressed. The investigator inquired once more about his relationship with Sarah and Preston. Liam shared that the three of them grew up on the same street, attended the same school, and were closely knit, sharing their deepest secrets and dreams. Preston even took Sarah to the prom, but there were no romantic feelings between them. Liam mentioned that he and Sarah were not just friends. He considered her his sister. They even listed each other as siblings on their social media profiles. Sarah had no secrets from him, and she had told him that her mother had left her a significant amount of cash, most of which was kept in a safety deposit box. Allegedly, Sarah didn't trust her father, who also claimed a right to the funds, so she stored the money in the bank, but planned to retrieve it soon to run away to Canada. When this story was relayed to Michael Stern, he was quite surprised and offered his version of events. According to him, his wife began saving money for their daughter's future, whether for education, a wedding, or a home, from the moment Sarah was born. The cash was kept at home, stored in a shoebox, with many bills being old and some quite worn, though no one thought much of it at the time. After his wife passed away, the father handed the box of money to Sarah, advising her to deposit the old and worn bills in the bank. Sarah followed his advice, depositing some of the money into her checking account for everyday expenses and renting a safety deposit box for the rest. She decided to use it to pay for university after finishing college and to travel the world. Michael sternly denied having any claim to the money for his own purposes. The revelation that the missing student had a large sum of money led investigators to consider the possibility that someone might have targeted her for financial gain. The investigation then decided to check her safety deposit box and bank transactions. It turned out that a few days before disappearing, Sarah had withdrawn a substantial amount from an ATM and had also visited the bank to take out some cash from her box. Another surprise awaited the detectives. Bank surveillance footage revealed that Sarah hadn't gone to the bank alone, but was accompanied by Liam who obviously knew about Sarah's banking activities. They decided to question Liam again, specifically why he hadn't mentioned this bank visit, which occurred on December 1st. His hesitation was noticeable, but he explained that Sarah trusted no one but him and had asked him to accompany her to the bank because she was afraid to carry a large amount of cash back home. His explanation seemed logical and his demeanor was natural. Moreover, it was discovered that a house across from the Stern residence had a security camera that captured the street and part of the neighbor's yard. Footage from this camera confirmed that Liam stayed at Sarah's house until 7 o'clock in the evening, then left for work and did not return. 
while the silver sedan left the garage around 11 o'clock at night. About a month after the girl's disappearance, another acquaintance of hers named Anthony, who had been out of town for several weeks and was unaware of the events, walked into the police station with a bizarre and chilling story. It turned out Anthony had been in the same class with Sarah, Liam, and Preston, and after graduating, he dived deep into studying filmmaking, maintaining communication only with Liam, who also had an interest in cinema. Anthony recounted that about a month and a half before Sarah vanished, Liam visited him, and one evening they brainstormed ideas for a horror flick aimed at teenagers. Liam quickly came up with a story about a girl who secretly tells a friend about a large sum of money she possesses. The friend, after gaining her trust and learning all the details, strangles her and dumps her body in a turbulent river. Anthony liked the plot, and they even wrote a couple of pages of the script that evening. However, Anthony soon moved on to another project, forgot about the story, and then left town for a real film shoot where he was working as a camera assistant. Upon his return, Liam unexpectedly called him, inquiring if the police had visited him or summoned him for questioning. Surprised by such questions and learning of Sarah's disappearance and the circumstances surrounding it, Anthony decided to go to the police himself. After hearing the new witness's testimony, the authorities suggested Anthony draw Liam into an open conversation and try to elicit a confession from him. Anthony agreed, and a plan was devised. He would invite Liam to collaborate on a project that required renting professional camera equipment, which they ostensibly couldn't afford. Knowing the suspect's aspirations of being in a movie, it was likely he wouldn't miss such an opportunity and might offer the money he took from Sarah. Liam took the bait almost immediately, but suggested they meet in person to discuss the details. A hidden camera was installed in Anthony's car, and he was instructed to carefully coax a confession out of his friend. When the two met and Liam got into Anthony's car, he looked around cautiously, as if afraid there might be someone else inside. He then handed over an envelope containing $2,000 in old bills, asking if it was enough to rent the filming equipment. Anthony nodded affirmatively and then inquired where Liam got so much old currency. Liam hesitated, then admitted the money was Sarah's, which he and Preston had taken from her house because the dead don't need it. He didn't go into further details, but his admission was enough for the police to arrest him and Taylor on suspicion of the crime. Preston quickly started cooperating with the authorities, striking a deal with the prosecution. He claimed he did not participate in the act itself, but helped his friend cover up the evidence and dispose of the body. According to Preston, Liam began devising plans to take Sarah's money as soon as he learned of its existence. It turned out that Sarah had kept her inheritance a secret even from her best friend for a long time. But when she seriously started planning her trip to Canada, Liam inquired how she intended to fund it, prompting Sarah to reveal the money left by her mother. Liam convinced her that such a sum was safer in a home safe than a bank vault and insisted she withdraw the cash. He even borrowed a significant amount from her right before the tragedy, the same money she had withdrawn from the ATM. When Sarah's father was out of town on a business trip, Liam decided it was time to put his plan into action. He roped in Preston by promising him $25,000. He decided to handle the dirty work himself, requiring his friend only to help him erase any traces. He convinced Sarah to withdraw the money, failing to check how much she took out. They spent the next day together, with Liam waiting for the right moment. He locked Sarah's dog in another room to prevent it from defending its owner. Approaching her from behind, he began to strangle her. However, the crime proved more challenging than expected. Firstly, the athletic and strong Sarah resisted fiercely, leading to a struggle until she lost consciousness. Secondly, just when he thought she had passed, she would show signs of life. It took the perpetrator about half an hour to be sure Sarah Stern was no longer breathing. Afterward, Liam left her house, heading to work, leaving Preston to step in. He snuck into Sarah's house through the back door, out of the camera's view, dragged the body to the garage, and tidied up the room. A couple of hours later, Liam returned, took a small safe from Sarah's room, 
placed the body in the car, and drove off in such a way as to avoid being captured by the neighbor's camera. He headed to the bridge where Preston awaited in his own vehicle. Together, they disposed of the body in the river, wiped down the steering wheel, and drove away in Preston's car back to Liam's house to split the loot. They faced a huge disappointment as they found only $110,000 in the safe, not the $100,000 McAtasney had anticipated. However, they decided not to spend the old bills immediately to avoid suspicion. The accomplice buried the safe in a local park, spending only the money Sarah had withdrawn from her account. Despite Preston's confession, Liam McAtasney steadfastly denied any wrongdoing, attempting to shift the blame onto his friend. McAtasney's lawyer also insisted on his client's innocence, suggesting Taylor acted alone. Moreover, as the body was never found and the circumstances of the disappearance remained unclear, there was a lingering possibility that Sarah was still alive, having vanished without her documents, money, belongings, or phone. A search of Liam's house turned up nothing except a small key, fitting the buried safe, identified by Preston. The trial lasted over two years, but despite the absence of a body and McAtasney's confessions, his guilt was established through the combination of evidence. The script described months before the incident, the key to the safe found in his home, his words captured in Anthony's car, and the old bills he handed over. Additionally, fingerprints of both Preston and Liam were found inside the safe, and a colleague testified that McAtasney was absent from work for a few hours that night, asking to be covered. Liam McAtasney was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. His accomplice, who did not directly participate in the act, received an 18-year sentence for obstruction of justice and hindering the investigation. Preston Taylor is eligible for parole no sooner than 15 years into his sentence. The body of college student Sarah Stern remains undiscovered to this day.